All right, here we go. Uh, hello, this is a podcast about the Raspberry Pi and how come it's popular. And uh, so Chris and I decided to get together with the help of uh, Jim Collison from the Home Tech Podcast. And uh, we're going to talk about the Raspberry Pi, why it's popular, some of the things we're kind of doing with it, some of the things you can do with it. So uh, let's get started. Hi, Chris. Hey, John. How's it going? Doing all right. So you got yourself a Raspberry Pi? I did. And that is the question. What am I going to do with this thing? <laughs> That's it, eh? Because a lot of these guys there, uh, you know, the two biggest things that I find interesting with the Raspberry Pi is that uh, it, uh, the biggest uh, pull for most people is that it does 1080p. So a lot of people are, are using it for, uh, to, uh, as a media player to play their, their video collection, so which is great. And then the other one is the, uh, the GPIO port, which is an, uh, a port on the back of it, uh, or on the one side there. I'll uh, hold mine up to the camera here. And uh, that's to interface to, uh, to different hardware stuff. And then I guess you also have the people that are, want to get into some kind of software stuff with, uh, you know, uh, Arc Linux or Debian or Fedora and all of that yeah. stuff. Yeah, nice. Chris, how, uh, how did you acquire your Raspberry Pi? What did you go through? Who would you buy it from? I got it from Newark. Right? They're up in Canada, okay. I believe. And any, any problems? Getting, I, I assume you waited a while. Uh, no, seem, I, I, seem, I, ordered, I ordered mine a little bit late, and I got it within a week or so. so oh, okay. Um, so they're shipping I, I, pretty quickly now. Yeah, I wasn't in on that first wave of, of Raspberry Pis. I think they made 4,000 in the beginning of things, and then they opened it up a little wider. And I, I must have been on that second or third wave of things. And there's a $25 version and a $35 version? Well, not currently. The 25 okay. buck version is not released yet. They okay. haven't uh, released that, although they've, they've got it waiting in the wings, I guess. And the only difference between the two is that the $35 version, which is the Model B, has an Ethernet controller on it, and the $25 one does not. Oh, so no, no, for us enthusiasts, no real sense in going $25 for the No, I, I don't part, right? think so. Okay. Um, they, they were saying that they expect about 90% of the people who get a Raspberry Pi to get the Model B. Um, so I, that's, that's probably true. You, for 10 bucks more, why would you not, right? Yeah, and you just got yours that just came in? Yeah, I've had it for maybe a week now, something like right. that, and it's, it's pretty exciting. You know, we hold those things around like this, you know, and I remember <laughs> yep. in, the, in the old days, right, you, <laughs> you wouldn't even touch a circuit board without it being grounded properly. John, are you worried at all about your, you know, with the, Handling your yeah, there you go. With the handling of that, like that, that are you worried about messing anything up? Circuits on there, anything like that? No, not really. Because uh, one of the things is uh, Eben Upton, who's the guy that kind of started all of this. Uh, he was he had made four goals of the Raspberry Pi, and uh, basically one of the goals is for it to be robust. Was for so it easy to easy and convenient to carry around. So like he wanted you know students to be able to or and kids like kids to be able to handle it. Uh, no, like with the there's a technology called like CMOS chips. You know which if you t touch them you know static they would short unless they were grounded and stuff. So uh, with with the Pi he wanted you know people to be able to you know or children to grab it. You know put it in their backpack. Not have very uh, delicate pieces on it that it would break off. This is uh, one of the reasons they went with the uh, the SD card. It, that's uh, you know because a lot of people were saying, well, why don't you add a uh, uh, micro SD card? But then that's it. Micro SD card is a little harder. Well, it would be more hidden. For, you know, it wouldn't be sticking out. But then it would you know kids would probably lose them quicker. So uh, so yeah, you can just kind of grab it and touch it all over. Just, you know, don't spill any water on it when it's plugged in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Is it submergible? You can't, can you submerge it in water while it's going in? Or maybe mineral oil, right? I've seen those mineral oil motherboard That probably things. wouldn't hurt it. Yeah. Chris, uh, hold yours up again. Is yours different than John's or exactly I, same, same I design? I think they're exactly the same because um, okay. this is the only one they're producing right now. All right, and you got a, you've got your uh, SD card in there. Yep. How big is that card? I got a four gig SD right. card in there. Very nice. And any restrictions on that card? Um, just, just your average run of the mill SD card is what goes in there. Yeah, I mean, I just kind of picked this one off my shelf and uh, stuck it in there, and it happened to work. Uh, John, do you know? Is there like an upper limit to these things? I'm not terribly sure. Well, I know that uh, if you go to uh, raspberrypi.org in their forums and stuff, they have uh, like a compatibility list. So some people have spoken about, uh, uh, you know, the keyboards they've used and even uh, with the, um, uh, you know, the wireless keyboards. So now you would have, let's say, a USB dongle. Uh, some of them is like, do they have the driver? Other people were talking about these SD cards where some of the class, uh, because you have, I think, was it, is there a class two? 
I'm not sure there's yeah, a class two. There's a bunch of them. There's like yeah. uh, SDX, you know, the high capacity ones and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, because there's a four, there's a six, and I think there's a ten. And some guys were having issues with some some of the faster ones, you know. So uh, I mean, your best bet I would say is to use it like a four gig stick, and then copy your S to the, uh, your OS to that one, and and then have like that's it. Have one SD card for let's say your. Uh, your uh, media center uh, OS, like RAS BMC, that's uh, a nice, uh, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes for that one. Uh, it's basically yeah, XBMC uh, software. So you would you can put that on one SD card. Then you would have, let's say, one for uh, the, uh, the Raspbian, which is the, the OS that you download from their site, which now you interact. You actually connect that to your monitor. You have your keyboard. You know, it's for good for kids for programming uh, software. Uh, I think that one of the software they give is Scratch. There's a browser in there. So yeah, there's uh, Python on there as well. Yeah. So then that's, that's it. That one you put that on, let's say, on another card. And then if you want to try Arc Linux or something else. So now, you know, kind of give yourself, buy yourself a four pack or whatever. Don't put everything on, try and put everything on the 32 gig stick, you know. I would recommend a four gig stick. Yeah, and I think I think four gig, if I'm not mistaken, is the highest that you can go without being SDHC, the high capacity version. Mm -hmm. And then one step further up is uh, SDX, if I remember right. And so okay. yeah, for compatibility's sake, I think the four gig is the is the ceiling. Yep. So that's it. So basically, uh, the I'll show up here and we'll point to the to the parts here. So basically, what happens is. Uh, like we said, it's credit card size, so you know, take out your. If you don't have a Raspberry Pi, you know, take out your credit card from your wallet. You know, you can use it for two reasons: to see how big your Pi would be and to order one. You know, so, wait, wait, uh, order one. Yeah, or, well, that, that's your more two, than one. You're right. Now that they uh, just last month or uh, a couple of weeks ago, they uh, dropped the limit where you know you can order more than one. So that's right, pretty good right. because apparently they started to. Uh, uh, they're able. To, they're actually producing like four thousand a day. So right. now there's no more that restriction, which was good that they did have a restriction because you know everybody wanted one and it was you know hard to get around. So uh, basically, uh, what you have here is the uh, you have the network connection. It's a 10100. You have two USB ports, uh, which is limited to 100. I think it's 140 milliamps. So sometimes you know if you if you try to connect a keyboard that has like a hub built into the keyboard and stuff, you're gonna run into issues. So there's there's a limit there, and this is one one of the points I I suggest is that to get yourself a very good uh, power supply, like a one amp or um, or two amp power supply. But we'll just go around the board. So now over here, oh, we have the HDMI connection, which is also uh, supports the audio. So if you ha you know you have a HDMI, because before earlier versions of the HDMI didn't support audio, in this case you do. Uh, now John, if I can interrupt you there. Yeah. I don't know this off the top of my head. Does that support, like, the surround sound protocols and stuff like that? I don't know. I don't know the details on it. I, I know it's a, ver a certain level, uh, 1.3 yeah. or something, so I don't know what that entails. But uh, I don't have a HD surround sound. Well, I have a HD surround, but not through a HDMI. I'd have to imagine it doesn't because they have to buy a license for that kind of thing. Okay. And then we have, uh, on the other side of the board, we have a, a composite video, which is the yellow, which a lot of old TVs have these ones. There's no VGA connection, which was another standard. Uh, you do have, again, uh, in the back, like I said, the SD card. Uh, there's a, they have a couple of nice little uh, interfaces that I guess eventually will be used. This one over here, it's a little, uh, I forget what they call these names, but there's a type of uh, connection there. It's a flat ribbon connection. Basically, you you you... If you see a little black bar, you kind of pull on it on each side very lightly. It'll only come out like an eighth of an inch, and then it'll drop to one side. And what you do is you put in the ribbon cable, and then you, it's, then you lock it again. So this one is supposed to be for their, eventually they're going to come out with a, uh, a camera module that'll plug in right here behind the, uh, the uh, network connection. And yeah, then the one that, go ahead. The plans for that is a 5 megapixel uh, sensor on there, so you'll eventually be able to take pictures with that thing. Yeah. That'll be pretty. Make, that'd make a nice little, um, you know, uh, we work with some um, uh, local universities here, and they do a lot of robotics, especially around crawling robotics. And, of course, adding, I mean, this would make, today they use full-size motherboards for those, um, you know, for that um, implementation, you know. So you, you'll see a little gigabyte, you know, motherboard on there or whatever. But I imagine these Raspberry Pis might make an additional, a, a very nice, uh, smaller footprint, yeah. maybe a little less power that, for something like that. That's going to be their bread and butter, low-power um, computing for stuff like that. That's exactly right. 
Yeah, and then they have a similar port uh, here at the back. I think the uh, VDS, I forget what they call it, but I think this is eventually going to be, you can connect like a LCD monitor. Don't don't bet on it there. Don't don't take my word for it there. But I think that's that's the case. So and then right here in the back is your uh, your twenty twenty. I think it's twenty six pin GPIO. So which this is what's really ni nice about the board for the the uh, tech enthusiast who wants to like you know uh, put together some uh, some breadboarding, some experimenting, connect some LCD uh, like let's say some two by sixteen by two character displays. You want to like you said uh, maybe some motors for robotics and such. It's very um, you have to be very careful on these ports because the resistance is very low. You don't want to blow it out. So uh, there is uh, some interface boards that you can buy. It. And uh, so I would suggest there, there's a site, adafruit.com. We'll put, a, again, a link. And uh, what you do is you end up getting, like, these sort of, like, breadboards like this here. And, uh, you know, you put all your components in it. And, like, I'm going to be wiring up these LCD screens. Uh, Adafruit, they sell a, something called the cobbler. So basically what it is, it's... Uh, you have a cable, a flat ribbon cable like this, and that'll plug onto onto the board here. So you make sure you plug it in the right orientation. And then the other part of the board will go on their interface, which is on that little uh, breadboard that you buy from them, or if you have the breadboard, that's fine. So you'll plug this guy onto there, and then you'll plug it onto the, uh, so it ends up, and then you'll plug it to the, uh, oops, <laughs> it's facing me. <laughs> Then you'll plug it onto uh, their little cobbler, which is a, a little, oh, a little blue inter. There goes my pie. <laughs> a little in cobbler, a little interface board on here, and then you can wire all the stuff. So th this is what's nice about you know you can change the configuration, you can test it before you connect it to your pie. So uh, that's that's what I'm looking I'm looking forward to. So so John, you've already tested in the course of the show the robustness of the board. <laughs> exactly a few times. <laughs> And the other board, there's another board uh, which ju they just started talking about it. I don't know if you're familiar with it, um, the GERT board. Uh, there's some links. Again, we'll put it to uh, raspberrypi.org. And uh, one of the developers, guys, that was very instrumental on uh, helping out with the Raspberry Pi project, he uh, he made a board. So uh, we'll put some links. And uh, have you seen that one? Have you heard yeah, about so, it? Yeah, so, you know, I haven't seen one in person because I, I haven't ordered one or anything. But that looks really interesting because it's not just a breakout to a breadboard uh, like the cobbler is. It serves kind of a different purpose. They've got a bunch of uh, um, IC chips on there and a bunch of LEDs and a bunch of stuff like that so that you can kind of get started without having to wire up uh, all the LEDs yourself. So that's kind of neat. Yeah, it's pretty good. I uh, like I said, this guy was instrumental in the development of the Raspberry Pi, so he knows a lot of that background knowledge. So then he kind of knew, and because it's for students, you know, they want to be able to have that, like you said, uh, an interface where, you, and you have a few levels, right? You can say, all right, I'll, it's an it's a board. Unfortunately, or fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, you have to assemble this board. It's not like the Raspberry Pi that comes right. pre-assembled. You do have to assemble it, and so, and a lot of the components are surface mount uh, components, which which are really tiny. So you better have a magnifying glass, or or you better teach your eight-year-old how to solder because they have better eyesight than you. Yeah, so, surface uh, mount components yeah. are really tough to work with compared to uh, the traditional DIP components. Uh, you you got to like put them in an oven and stuff like that and have special uh, tools to work with them. Okay. Well, I know on their site there, they're showing there's a little demo on how to solder, and, and they were kind of doing it pretty nice with the, just a little soldering iron and stuff. But professionally, yeah, you usually you heat the board and you put the – that's how they do it professionally there. You know, you heat the board, you put – I guess they put some solder, they put the compound, the connectors or components, and then bang, they just yeah. stick. I I've seen some people around the community, uh, maybe not with the GERT board, but with Arduino and all of that, using like an Easy Bake Oven and that kind of thing to <laughs> really, to, uh, yeah, to, <laughs> to mount some surface mount components. Easy so, Bake. So uh, people will find a way. John, while we have a, a second, let, we've picked up quite a few viewers on YouTube, and uh, l let me let folks know if they are watching on uh, on the G Plus or YouTube, uh, you can join us for some chat if you want to ask these guys some questions or get your questions answered. Uh, jump over to theaverageguy.tv slash live, and there's a chat box right below that, and uh, then we'll be able to see you, and you can get your, at least get your questions into the show from there. Okay, averageguy.tv slash live. Go ahead, John. Okay, yeah, so I'm just going to head over to uh, Raspberry Pi, their website, and find a, an image for their GERT board. Chris, you have it. something you want to add while I look for this? 
Uh, yeah, it's just, th this is exactly, it, it's interesting to me because this is like, this is like the logical conclusion to the hardware hacking industry that popped up around Arduino. Um, so this is a full Linux computer. This is unlike uh, the Arduino boards that we have, which, which are also very fun. Um, but with these things, you, you upload your code to the board, and then it runs in a loop, and you can control devices and stuff like that. And this is a little different. I mean, you plug this thing in, and you have a full Linux computer. Uh, so, so in some ways, I feel like this is like a uh, compliment, and it's kind of the logical conclusion. I, this is going to be kind of the final form factor, don't you think? Uh, you know, I c I've kind of heard some grumbling about the USB ports not being uh, yeah. uh, powerful enough, and and I think on mine here, I actually, you know, uh, we got to put what is, what do you call it? One of those stipulations, like don't try this at home or whatever before you start. <laughs> but uh, which means uh, you should immediately try it at home. Yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, I actually did a little bit of a pi bypass here. I'm bringing the the plus five volts, so you can see in this image. There's a well, depending on how clear it is, on the back of the board, there's a uh, fuse, and I'm bringing five volts from there all the way to the uh, USB port where there's a five volts uh, power there. So what I ha I'm actually bypassing the uh, the fuses because some people were saying they're uh, yeah, some people were saying that the fuses are a little bit on the weak side and you can jump them. Again, uh, if people are interested, we could put some links in the show notes about or just go to raspberrypi.org in their forums and. And uh, there's a discussion on there, so uh, there's a couple of little things that uh, it's it's not like the greatest, uh, but you know for the regular. This is why sometimes you know if people just took out their keyboard and mouse and plugged it all in and and used their uh, regular charger, you know they might run into a couple of little problems. So it's it's good to know that uh, you know go to their websites like and uh, you know check out some of the details. Like I said, my, my biggest thing the first week I had it, my biggest problem was the power supply. So you know I I lived it. And John, what what components were you plugging in there into the USB ports when you had problems with that? Uh, just a regular keyboard, not uh, no without any hub, and a wired a regular wired uh, mouse. And I was getting like it was booting up. Uh, sometimes I wouldn't get a good network connection. Uh, right. Sometimes uh, it would uh, I would be getting some error messages on the screen. So you you did you know the monitor was plugged in and it would do some writing, but then it would stop. And then it would get a couple of error messages and stuff. So if I maybe if I unplugged the USB keyboard and mouse, and then I booted it up again, then it kind of like went through everything. And uh, but that's it. The, my problem is because I was using a power supply that was uh, too low. And uh, there's a good video there. We'll put a, another link in the show notes for this one. There's a guy over on YouTube, and he uh, it's in our show notes. The guy talks about uh, you know measuring. Um, you know the voltage on your Raspberry Pi. So basically, what you would do is you would use a a, a, you know, a multimeter like this, sir. You know, I have a little cheap multimeter. So what you would do is you would just you know put it on voltage, and uh, then you would uh, plug in your power supply. So don't put anything in in the Pi, like no SD card, no wires, no nothing. You you kind of want to check it uh, like bare bones with nothing connected, and. Uh, so then you'll plug in your power. Now it does make a difference. Your USB, your micro USB. Like first of all, it's the power supply, and then also that cable that you're using. If you're using a poor quality cable, it actually will drop the voltage. So you know you want to kind of get yourself a good one. So if you're in the U.S., I would say you know go to Adafruit. They have like a five. I think it's a 5.2 volt power supply, uh, one amp. So and then get the cable from them, and you shouldn't have any problems. And I, they designed this thing around the uh, European standard. I think it's like 800 milliamps or something like that. And so I bet you in Europe people won't have as much trouble with it. But mm -hmm. here in the U.S. and Canada, the, some of those cables just can't put out that kind of uh, amperage. So yeah. you'll have to check it. <laughs> so what you would do is, uh, so basically you would plug, plug into the power. Here's a micro USB port, and just to remind folks that it's not like like the USB port. It's it's just for power. It's there's no data here. You can't just plug in and expect to use it like a, a micro USB. It's just for the power. And uh, then what happens is you have two points on the uh, on the card. They're called TP1 and TP2. One's up in the right fat fingers. Yeah. Yeah, one's in the uh, next to the yellow uh, video connector, and one's there at the bottom. Yeah, next to the uh, halfway between the capacitor and the uh, HDMI connector. So what you would do is you would put the uh, the negative up on the uh, 
the one TP2, and then the positive on TP1, and you would measure there, and you should have 5 volts. If you have less than 5 volts, you're in trouble. And then, uh, so that's it. So this is why if you get a 5.2 volts, chances are after the current goes through the, the capacitor and the voltage regulator, you know, it might draw, uh, dip a bit. So you should have around 5 volts, 4.9, 4. Point, uh, somewhere around there. And then once you plug everything in, your keyboard and mouse, then measure again, and you should have a, uh, above 4.7, yeah, 4.7, 4.75 volts. If you have low, lower than that, expect to have some issues. Unfortunately, you have to have a multimeter to check this out, but uh, at least if, you know, don't say, don't think that, okay, I'm running into problems, it's a defective Raspberry Pi, I want to ship it back and start all, all these costs. Try to get yourself your hands on a, on a, either just eliminate the problem by getting yourself a good power supply or else measure with your, uh, with your uh, multimeter because some of the things people have tried is their uh, power supplies because that's one of the things, right, to keep the price of the Raspberry Pi down is they don't supply you with the uh, power supply or keyboard or mouse and that's because, you know, they exp and HDMI cable because they more or less you have those things lying around the house. So, um, John, let so me ask you, on your power out. supply, are you, is it plug-in straight into the wall or are you coming off a, a USB port from your computer? Well, that's it. The power, the little uh, adapter would go uh, right into the wall and then okay. it, and it has a USB uh, type connector. So now you would put a USB cable, USB uh, whatever it is, standard to mm -hmm. a micro mm -hmm. USB and you would uh, plug that in there. I think yeah, I have a couple of them lying around. Chris, what are you what are you using for your power supply? At this the way point? I'm using mine is a little bit different because I'm not plugging in a keyboard or a mouse. Uh, I'm plugging it in just from USB on my computer and just plugging it directly like that. And but I'm not using the the high power peripherals. Um, I plugged the XB into this thing, which is a wireless um, communications device, and that thing doesn't pull uh, much current, so that that part is okay. And then I've been using um, PuTTY to SSH into it and then use Linux that way uh, as opposed to plugging it into a monitor. Uh, so that's a little bit different. Does it automatically grab an IP address then when you plug it into your network? It's, yeah, I, okay. I plugged it in and it talked to DHCP and pulled an IP address and then I gave it a reservation and uh, able to get into it that way. And th there's a standard username and password that they've got. It's the uh, username is Pi and the password is Raspberry. Nice. Yeah, that's it. My brother has a. Um, I keep saying that's it. My brother, that's a bad habit to say that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. Uh, but my brother has a. Um, I think it's a Belkin router. Uh, no, Belkin. Sorry, USB hub. And that thing, I think it's an amp, an amp and a half, and he's able to power his uh, his Pi with that power supply so now it, it kind of eliminates a um, you know a power supply like another you know outlet on the wall because what he's doing is he's using the hub to power the you know with a, with a USB to micro USB cable to power the Raspberry Pi then he takes the hub plugs it into the uh, the, uh, the input of the, the USB port on the Raspberry Pi so now he's not loading uh, putting any load or a very little load on the uh, on the USB on the two port USB uh, on the uh, Raspberry Pi, and then he, he's connecting every all of the peripherals. You know, if he wants a keyboard or camera and stuff like that, because some guys have done some amazing projects with even with the uh, USB cameras and stuff. Mind you, again, you have to find all the libraries and stuff. We'll get to that uh, a little later, and you know that's it. So now you'll be plugging the, that in there. You can plug your uh, if you get a. Uh, uh, USB, uh, like a you know two and a half inch one of those uh, Western Digital Passport, uh, you know uh, two and a half inch drives. You know you you can't power it off the Pi. You have to plug it in into the a USB hub. So John, let me make sure I got that architecture right. So he's got this Belkin uh, powered router or powered USB hub. He's coming. Out, it's I assume it's multi port, f three, three, four, five ports in it. Yeah, seven seven ports. So one of those is coming off and powering the, the Pi. He's going then back into that and and then everything else or, or the hub is coming is plugged into that as well. I, I guess I don't understand. Is it using it for both power and as a hub for the Pi? Yeah. Okay. So that's it. So what happens is just like on these USB guys or on these power mm -hmm. plugs, right, you have a, a, that type of connector which is like on the hub. So now you would have your wire coming from here powering the hub, uh, powering the Pi. He's, mm -hmm. Instead of going into here, he's going into the hub. Got it. 
on the other side, that's it. It's like one's a power, and then the other one is using it on the Pi to yeah. use uh, their peripherals and stuff. And then he's plugging his hard drives or whatever else might draw more power because it's going to draw the power from the hub, not from the Pi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to do it. That's be a nice. Uh, see if you can track down that the the model that he's got for from that Belkin router that or Belkin um, USB hub. As a matter of fact, uh, I have a link because I was saying I think his is an amp or an amp and a half, but I'll, I know over at uh, this week at uh, Adafruit.com, I'll put a link for that one. They have a hub there, and I think it's third. I think it's around the thirty dollar mark. I'll find it a little later and maybe pull, uh, show everybody a link. And that one is basically the, the same thing. It's a seven port hub. It's got it's two amps, so uh, it you know. If you're going to go to Ras uh, um, Adafruit, because one of the things, right? You know, it's it's a great site. These guys are. Uh, I ad I advise everybody to go to those guys. You know, if you need to get your power supply that you didn't get from your hub, uh, from your Raspberry Pi, from your Newark or uh, Element 14 or those guys, go get it at. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, go grab it from Adafruit. They have uh, the breadboards there. They have the little cobbler uh, connectors there, so, so that you can connect to the GPI. Old port of the Raspberry Pi. They got a lot of bells and whistles. Friday they ha they do a sh uh, a blog post called uh, Pi Day, so they have all the they talk about all their little peripherals that they uh, they come out with, and that's it. This week they announced that uh, two amp uh, USB hub, which is very good for the Pi. Uh, if you have the the Arduinos and stuff like that, so there's some good stuff there. And the other thing is they have a uh, a learning center so they actually are doing projects so if you're a little bit skeptic like one of the things I wanted to do is is with the LCD screen right so it's like well how do you how do you wire that all up you know well if you go to Adafruit there's a lot of resources on the internet but uh, one I would suggest again is this site Adafruit and they kinda go in through it step by step they tell you what parts you need they give you images there's a video they show you you know how to wire it up they give you uh, they talk about some software called Fritzing which is uh, it's like a uh, graphical UI and basically all these like LCD panels or your Pi and stuff they look like images and you kind of bring them into this uh, this application and then and then you do your wiring and stuff like that so you're kind of doing it visually on your PC and then after you, you transfer that you know to your to your physical boards and stuff like that so they have a really good resource there the other right. software that is really popular for designing circuits and that kind of thing is uh, Eagle. That's the one where, that's like the professional open source tool that you can use. And you, you can, it's kind of hard to use, but if you can wrap your head around it at least, that you can actually export from that and um, send it off to a circuit board maker so that you can uh, get some prototype going. Uh, so that's what um, the people over at Adafruit use I think to design all of all of theirs uh, but Fritzing is a lot more uh, friendly and you know graphical and that kind of thing so um, in Adafruit for every bit of equipment that they make they open source the reference design and they usually have like Eagle files to download so that you can look at these things and they have an entire project page that uh, details where you can buy everything that they are selling you uh, elsewhere <laughs> and how to make it and you can ask questions in their forms about it so that that website is absolutely uh, invaluable to the kind of hardware hacking uh, industry that's popped up definitely yeah and that's it like you said these uh, image these uh, things you can download these the software and, and again like these fritzing libraries you can download from them they have uh, and they actually came out with because the the main person there um, uh, what's her name uh, do you recall her name uh, uh, Lee Moore Freed. Yeah, that, that's right. You got yeah, it. I think that's her. Yeah, they. Or, uh, uh, she, she's Lady Ada. Lady Ada. Yeah, she's an engineer. So, I mean, she's got all the answers. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they came out with a, a distro uh, distribution, like a, an OS, basically, uh, called the Occidentals. And what they're doing in there is uh, again, go. You know, we'll put a link, or just go to Adafruit.com and do a search for Raspberry Pi and look for Occidentalis. And uh, what that is is that's uh, a Linux distribution that co contains a bunch of these files. So uh, because that's it, you know, let's say if you're going to want to use the uh, LCD, you you need. Remember, like on a on a Windows PC, you know, you plug in the printer, you have to go get drivers. You plug in something else, a network card, you have to get drivers. So here, it's a bit like that that type of thing. Is you you need to have that that software, those drivers type thing or those folder files, on 
you know uh, loaded into the memory of the of the Raspberry Pi. So a lot of these uh, whatever these bits uh, software bits, it's in, they've put this into they've merged it into this software. So now you'll have a lot of that uh, stuff already you know preset for you. So that's a good thing. John, you know that a lot of the guys that hang around our community are, of course, video freaks, right? They like to run video, and they've heard that this has, you know, HDMI out, and there's some, you know, been some questions about just how much video you can push through it, and and have either one of you heard or know of, and Tim is asking this in chat, if they've had any luck playing, uh, you know, Blu-ray rips with something, with, with the Pi. Is that really what it's designed? Can you push it that hard? I think you could. Uh, I'll point you to... Uh Again, a link. It's uh, I saw a interview. But Leo Laporte interviewed the uh, the creator Eben uh, Upton, or one of the main guys, because there's a few guys. You know, we want to give them all uh, some credit too. You know, but Eben Upton is like the main guy, and he was he did a, a show called uh, Triangulation with the Leo Laporte. Uh, let me see. I think I have the date and here. He said in that show also, this thing has been in the making for six years. Oh wow. Yeah. I, so would have, he, I wouldn't have thought that, Chris. I would have thought maybe yeah. like the last two or yeah, 18 months. Yeah, that's what I would have thought, too. Wow. And, uh, this guy works for Broadcom, and he's the one who designed the GPU in this. And so they've got, it's like a quad-core GPU then, that you can push pretty hard. So even though the, uh, the main CPU on this board is kind of weak, you know, ARM 700 megahertz chip, um, you can push that GPU to a little bit bigger limits than you can the uh, main chip. And exactly. Yeah. John, that date you're looking for, July 18th, 2012, on that uh, Laporte episode over there at Twit. There you go. Yeah. So I recommend you uh, you listen to that. It's a good video. It's uh, that's it. He talks about the points of uh, like I had brought up earlier there, where you know the the four main goals were to make it interesting, which is 1080p, because that's a lot of times it's like I'd like to plug this in, maybe get some software and like get it running. Right away, I don't. I might not want to do some coding right off the bat. I just want to see. Well, what could it do now? And then maybe later get into the details. So this is where that 1080p uh, stuff comes in. It's like, and he mentions about Blu-ray and all of that. So and then the speed and stuff. So he gets a little bit more technical than what I know about uh, the uh, resolution. So listen to that. And then the second step was uh, for it to be programmable, which is because uh, with the Raspberry Pi, right? This is. is Basically, you know, it's not going to do anything unless you put software on that uh, SD card. So I think the way it's set up is there's a bootloader, which is a software on the chip that goes to that goes to look at the SD card and says, "Do you have any software for me to run?" Yeah, okay, fine, and then it loads it. Whereas uh, some other devices, like there's, uh, um, let me see, I think it's, t um, I forget the company. They're coming out with an Android APC, and that one, basically, the software. The OS is right on the chip, so it loads Android right from the beginning, and then you would have to maybe kind of redirect it to to go and get some other software that's on the uh, on the SD card. But with Raspberry Pi, it's like it goes to the SD card. So if you're saying I got Linux, you know, a distribution of let's say Debian on there, or the RasBMC, which they re recommend, or um, uh, Raspbian, sorry, is their software because Raspbian is the OS. Which is like a desktop interface, and RAS BMC is the multimedia stuff that, like XBMC. So then it would go to that card and would read it, and then boot up, and, and so forth. And they're both a custom implementation of Debian Linux for okay. uh, for ARM. And then the fourth part, uh, I mean, the third part I mentioned before was robust, and then the fourth uh, goal that they had was for it to be cheap, which is uh, which does boy, mean they, cheap, cheap quality, but that. cheap inexpensive. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's been a great deal. You know, Chris, you were mentioning, uh, you know, the how they they've got a pretty nice graphics implementation on there. Mm -hmm. I mean, Moore's law is in our favor at this point, right? I mean, this thing doesn't get you can't get any cheaper, but it can continue to get better as as chip prices so, fall, right? I mean, do you guys see that? Have they talked about that in the community at all? Are are there are there faster things yet still to come, or are they pretty content with what they've got right now? I think they're okay for now, but uh, you got to think that sometime in the future, once this thing settles down a little bit, that they're going to start to push it a little further. I've also seen some people uh, overclocking this thing to a gigahertz, uh, which is pretty crazy. But yeah, you know, it's funny because they're they're talking about their initial alpha design, and they were using a chip similar to Arduino. That's the Atmega six four four they were using, and that thing is like an eight bit tiny processor that doesn't do a whole lot and then you know in the past six years what's happened is we've seen this emergence of 
ARM-based tablets and phones uh, on the market, and that's really enabled somebody to build this thing in a way that just wasn't possible back then. So it must have been an interesting uh, few years for, the, for those guys. Yeah, and the uh, the point I wanted to make is that uh, these goals, you know, it's important. Like the, they they took four good goals because if they would have made this board like uh, uh, just like cheap, twenty five bucks, thirty five bucks, and and you really had to kind of like you know get software. Like if it was hard to get running, then people would have said, "Oh, I don't care. It's thirty five dollars. Uh, uh, there's no interest. It's not pulling, dragging me in." So again, these are this is one of the points. Make it interesting. So see, making it interesting is actually more important. Than being cheap, it's like you know, make it interesting, make it that kids want to do it and stuff like. And sometimes people, right? You know, if something is interesting, it, it draws them in. They don't care what the price is. It's like, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, that's the price I'm willing to pay a certain amount to to enjoy to have some enjoyment. And if it's twenty five, thirty five, forty five, or a hundred dollars, then you know, I'll pay it. You know, if if you have enough to kind of pull me in. But in this case, you know, it's good that they kept that uh, that price low. And as uh, the other point I wanted to make was. Uh, that's it. Like they originally, they were going to come out with the Model A, which I think was only one USB connection and no network connection. And this is where, it, and it actually takes less power. Whereas this one, yeah, takes 700 milliamps. I think that one took around 400 or less. So quite, quite a half as I think half as much, 350, 400 milliamps. So, uh, but then you know, folks were kind of saying, well, as soon as they get it, they said the first thing they're going to do is add a network connection. Mm -hmm. So they said, hey, if we're for the 10 bucks, we'll you know we'll put it in. Which, in a way, you kind of think, you know, I, I'm kind of thinking $10 just for the network connection. You know, they should have did that for $3 or $5, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm just being greedy. Yeah, John, I'm not sure you have any room to complain with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't go. There that. you go. <laughs> so, uh, but there you go. So, uh, and I, I think once, again, they, they, they're up to 4,000 boards uh, a day. And I think once they get enough of these out in the market, then I think, I hope that they they release that Model A because it's it's on the books, you know. So some people say, well, look, I'd like to have that Model A. I don't really need, uh, you know, even like as far as the the GPU, you know, graphics. Like guys like you that want to say, well, I want to use this as a PHP server or a, a Quantum Media server or a Squeeze Play server and that type of thing. It's like I don't really need the graphics. I just want to be able to interface to it and yep, maybe yep. run some Arduino uh, hardware and stuff like that. So I can do that with the twenty five dollar board. So uh, and then the other thing uh, that I do know that that they've confirmed is like you said earlier is the camera. So and th that's something that they're going to come out with. Whereas the uh, you know now more or less people are coming out with their their own little boards. Like there's a bunch of little links that you can get these these add-on boards. Like uh, like I said, uh, uh, Adafruit they have their little cobbler and stuff to connect stuff. But some guys are actually making these little daughter boards uh, where, where uh, that they have like uh, relays on it. So now you can. Uh, run stepper motors and stuff like that, and so there, there's a market after uh, after what do you call it after aftermarket aftermarket some after uh, yeah so these little boards so th there you go so that's that's uh, there's a good business in there and then the other thing is cases maybe in the future we'll uh, we'll order ourselves some cases but that's, that's one of the thing that uh, you know they didn't supply when they made again to keep the cost down and all that is they didn't make a, a case available and now you're you're starting to see a lot of good uh, uh, Choices available again. Adafruit has a, cl a clear case that you kind of you know you buy it in pieces and you assemble it. Be yes, very very careful when you case. yeah yeah that's it. Then be very careful because acrylic tends to be like a bit of a hard plastic, and if you kind of break one of because they have like these claws on it, you have to put the piece on and then lock it. And some people are kind of doing it the wrong way. So the little hook part that holds the part that's uh, the you know the pl the the side plate that's really small, and you might snap it off, and you snap it off. Now you're going to be using uh, some contact cement. <laughs> so, uh, so that's your choice. And then your other, another nice choice was a guy came out one with one called the Pi Bow. Have you heard about that one? Mm -mm. Yeah, it's like uh, you know Pi from Raspberry Pi and Bow from Rainbow. And what that one is, it's it's a multi-layer colored uh, um, case. And that's it. It's like it's again. I think it's acrylic. It's like maybe seven slices of pie, <laughs> different colors, <laughs> nice. and you just kind of stack them. And uh, so we'll, maybe we can put a link on that one. But uh, just you know, just Google Raspberry Pi. Google's your friend. Raspberry Pi, Pi Bow, and uh, they're starting to ship those. And that's another nice little phenomenon there, where you know, it's like this guy comes up with an idea for Raspberry Pi, and you know, people are banging down his door to try and get uh, trying to get their hands on them.
And also, since this thing is at the uh, uh, nexus of, of the hardware hacking world, you've also got a bunch of people who happen to have 3D printers, like the MakerBot and stuff like that. And they're making designs and, uh, you know, printing them out and selling them on eBay and stuff like that. So this is kind of wide open for the community to... Uh, uh, this is one piece that is wide open to the community to build cases for it. And I'd even print them at home. I, I wish I had a 3D printer to do that kind of thing with. Yeah, so do I. I've seen uh, some websites. I think it's one is called uh, the Verge, Tverge, or Tinaverge, something uni like Universe, but the Universe. Oh, thing of Thingiverse dot com. Thingiverse. There you go. Yeah. And uh, like I came across those guys, and I think that's it. Uh -huh. They had they, you basically you have your drawings, that you, or people are posting because it's like an open source type thing. People are posting their drawings, so uh, if you go over there, and you know you can get download those drawings, and if you have a guy local, because you know let's say uh, this kind of the Raspberry kind, uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, grew out from these guys, uh, Evan Upton and the, his his guys over in uh, Cambridge in uh, London in England. So there's like everything is kind of like growing over there. So you see some of those guys. I think the Pi Bowl. Pibo case guy is out in the UK. So sometimes you might find it expensive, you know, to ship some stuff to you. So now if you go to the this site and you download these uh, these drawings for the cases, you might be able to find some local guy and you, you know, you just walk in with a piece of uh, plexiglass or acrylic and you say, "Hey, you know, here's the design. You know, I don't have a 3D printer, I don't have a laser, in this case a laser uh, printer, a laser cutter." It says and then you just supply him the plastic, you give him the drawing and say, "You know, can you make this for me for 10 bucks?" So and because, like, you said, and there's also these hacker spaces and stuff that they they might have either access to a 3D printer or a, a, a laser printer. Yeah, or, and those those things are starting to get actually reasonably priced. Uh, you can get some un not assembled um, 3D printers that you have to solder together yourself for a few hundred bucks. I'd have to look it up to give you an actual price, but somewhere on the order of like three, four, five hundred bucks. Uh, as opposed to if these things used to be, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. And they're, they're starting to come down themselves a little bit, too. We're seeing Moore's Law uh, prove itself again there. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your uh, your XB and some of your uh, your stuff that you have there as far as connecting to the GPIO port. Sure. So uh, I've uh, what I wanted to get this thing for was to just be a little uh, development box. You know, I've had like a netbook sitting off in the corner that I hooked an XB uh, unit up to to get some wireless communications going. And this thing is perfect for that. This, it's, you know, like you said, it's 35 bucks. You, you, could, buy, you could buy three or four of these things and, and you know, not feel it too hard in, in the wallet. And it's perfect for kind of the lone wolf web developer. I mean, you, you can install PHP and MySQL. You know, that's kind of the technology stack that Facebook is built on, for example. It's called LAMP stack and the LAMP server. Um, and you can even install uh, Webmin, which is a standard Linux UI to, to configure things. Like you can even make a proxy server out of this. You can make a VPN server. You can do all kinds of stuff. Just because it's running Linux, you, you just opens up this wide range of software capabilities. So, um, so I put PHP on it, and I put uh, an XB on it, and I wrote a PHP library for XB so that I could interface with this thing um, through GPIO pins or through the USB connection. And th then you can talk remotely from that web server to any other arbitrary XB uh, since it's a mesh network. So uh, there's really an incredible amount of possibilities there. I, I even saw somebody install MySQL server on this thing in a two Raspberry Pi cluster, which is <laughs> pretty wild. You know, I said earlier, why'd you buy just one? You, you should buy two and then cluster them. A stacked cluster? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's what I've been doing. You know, I can, I've at least got the capability now to turn off uh, a little LED remotely. You know, that's always the first step. Can you blink that LED? <laughs> yeah, that's like what, that's what matters. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's like saying, you know, when you're writing a program and you want it to output Hello World, you know? Yeah, so that's right. right. Same, same kind of deal, yeah. So I've also seen, John, maybe you'll be interested in this, that somebody wrote, I think it was with Arduino and XB, a, a program to talk to a 16x2 um, LCD display with an XB remotely and PHP. Cool. 
I'll have to get my hands on uh, on an XB and see how see how that goes. Because I've heard that name before. I've never uh, got into the Arduino stuff, but uh, yeah, I, I've always played around with the little boards and doing some wiring and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it makes me think. Uh, check out uh, those guys at Adafruit. There last night on Saturday yeah. night, they have their their show, and I think they said that there's uh, they're releasing like three types of uh, XB. Have you seen that? Uh, Check out their site, and I think they have one XB Pro and an X. Like they mm -hmm. actually showed on this on the monitor, like three different uh, boxes, uh, devices, and they were saying how they're they're um, kind of in touch with the the whoever that makes those boards, because you know uh, to get low prices for the customers and to also to create these libraries and stuff like that to make all that software available and stuff. So there's a nice uh, community around that. Yeah, the, actually, the way they do these things are are really confusing. There's uh, the XB Series 1, which is the one that I have, and that's like really low power. And then there's the Series 2, and there's the Pro, and they all have different features. And I think the Pro does like actual Zigbee communication, whereas the Series 1 uh, can't. It can only go over their implementation of Zigbee. Um, so if you're, if you're going to go buy one of these things, make sure you uh, do your research and uh, go to Ad Adafruit and Spark Fun and, and guys like that. And, Look around and see what's out there, uh, but I've got I've only got the series one here. Okay. All right. Uh, a little cu a couple of links I wanted to point out too was uh, another one was called the Magpie Magazine. This guy, uh, if you've seen it, I think it came out in July. It's like an online. Uh, it's a uh, you know a community of uh, people interested, just like us, we're interested in the Raspberry Pi, and. Um, what they do is they have a, an online magazine that you can download. So it's uh, it's uh, monthly. So uh, you know, download that PDF and take a look. And they they got some good resources in there. They talk about the software, like programming uh, using Scratch. They talk about uh, they uh, like these little per these little boards uh, again. How how to wire them up? They got some diagrams there because um, you know it, sometimes you need to see something written down. You know, if somebody's just telling you how to do it verbally, that might not be enough. Which is what's nice about Adafruit, their learning center. But these guys got uh, some good information. I think the latest. Uh, um, uh, edition of the Magpie. They had an interview with Eben Upton and his wife uh, uh, Liz, and uh, so that's a, that's a good read. Look forward to that every month. The other places I like is uh, there's a YouTube uh, channel called uh, Let me see um, Linux Linux. What was it? Raspberry Pi for beginners. Let me oh the sure. Linux Action Shows. What you're talking okay. Well, about. there's yeah, there's a, there's a Linux action show which they have a, a one video which about halfway through they talk about the Raspberry Pi, so uh, that's a good episode to take a look at. Uh, this other one was uh, yeah, Raspberry Pi beginners on YouTube. So check that out. This guy comes out with uh, he's a I think a, a student, and he's, he comes out with a bunch of different videos of how to do different things with the Raspberry Pi. So that's something nice I've checked out. Uh, let me see. Um, you know, you've built something yeah. kind of incredible when little cottage uh, YouTube video uh, uh, publishers start cropping up around what you've made. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's like you got you got that following, which is which is you know it's it's a bit like free advertising. Like these, I'm sure these <laughs> yeah. guys they don't have to go and pay to to advertise the Raspberry Pi. It's they put the, you know do their you know as long as they got like a nice logo and something that's you know fun that's attractive and then you know the good product and then like it'll sell itself you know so that's great uh, and then the other two sites I would say to go visit is uh, I find that I've been finding a lot of my information uh, when I kind of got interested in Raspberry Pi came from Andrew Edney's site over at uh, Connected Digital World so he does a lot of posts on uh, on Raspberry Pi and also he they, he and Ian Dixon who's uh, owns the site, the, digi the Digital Lifestyle, he does some posts also. They have a Raspberry Pi section on, on their site. So, yeah, Ian, uh, Ian Dixon yeah. got in really early on the Raspberry Pi. He must have gotten one of the first ones that was made. I, he, he must have ordered it like at midnight the night that it was available or something like that. Yeah. So well, he's been doing like good work over there. Yeah, they're, like these two guys are in the UK, right? So, uh, I mean, even uh, Andrew Edney there, he was fortunate enough. They had like... Uh, uh, a raspberry uh, raspberry pi jam ra a raspberry jam which is where these communities again free pub pu uh, publicity it's like these people are getting together people who have raspberry pis or don't have raspberry pis you know they like to get some information and now there's this guy uh, uh, O'Donoghue I think his name is I'll have to find details sorry if I messed up your name and uh, 
he's kind of setting up together these Raspberry Jams. And, uh, you know, there's a website that you go and you say, I want to set it up and invite people and stuff. And, and uh, you know, they get together. So uh, one of these Raspberry Jams, I think it was the one that was in Cambridge, uh, Andrew Eddy was there and he was taking some photos. As a matter of fact, one of his photos is, is the cover photo of the, uh, the latest uh, Magpie magazine. So he took some photos there, and he was able to. He was carrying a box of 100 Raspberry Pis from their car to, you know, to the table, thinking, you know, how do I get away from here <laughs> with this box? You know, how do I? So, do uh, yeah. So he's lucky to get, the, or fortunate, I should say, to uh, to get some firsthand, uh, you know, even the interviews and, you know, talking to uh, Evan Upton and his crew. And uh, and that so they, if you listen to their podcast, they, they got some. Every once in a while, they talk a little bit about uh, some Raspberry Pi news. Now, John, you said uh, the Raspberry Pi Jam, and it makes me think of uh, starting to try and get some music processing going in this little device. I hadn't thought of that before. I'll have to see if it has some kind of like MIDI capabilities or something like that, control keyboards and stuff like that. I'll have to look into that. Cool. Yeah, you would, Chris. You'd think that would it would be a perfect kind of add-on yeah. device to plug in, maybe, maybe MIDI out, uh, and then mm -hmm. right into the keyboard and give you some effects to record uh, some some uh, sequencing. Yeah, there's some um, there's some cottage little industry out there with uh, Arduino and processing DSP um, audio signals and that kind of thing. So I, I'm sure I'm sure that'll that'll happen with the Raspberry Pi too, since it has so much more processing power than. And the Arduino and all of its uh, clones and all that. So, I don't know. I, I hadn't really thought about that, but I, I wouldn't mind uh, jamming with my Raspberry Pi. That would be kind of cool. You know, a couple years back, um, we we tried this one laptop per child program, and and it never yeah. really. I mean, it came and it went. They just were expensive to to develop. Um, from what you guys know, is this a platform that can? I mean, could I put a? Could I realistically put this in a box that? Um, had a UI and and could I create a, you know it'd be it need to be a Linux distribution of some kind but could I create a workable PC out of this thing? We talk about it controlling stuff, but would it would it do the job of replacing a, a PC, so to speak? Well, I think it's it's a little bit underpowered for that. I, I mean, it depends. You'd have to set your expectations right for it because you you know if <laughs> if you want to boot this thing up, you're not going to be encoding video and stuff like that, but um, or at least not in any efficient manner, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's at a place where you could you could boot up Firefox or whatever it is and browse around the web for a little while, but you know, it's not going to be you know, it's, I'm not going to be ditching my Core i7 that's on my floor over no, here anytime no, but soon, I, right? <laughs> Chris, in the context of uh, of the one laptop per, chi per child, is it possible that this could be the front end of to get? You know, computing, John, you said one of the goals of this project was to get, you know, to get this inexpensive hardware into kids' hands for education. Could we see this replacing at least some devices or kids building their own tablet-like devices that run some kind of Linux distribution? And is there is there a good touchscreen distro for Linux that would, would be like a Android or a, you know, a, an I, iPhone distro? I'd say it would be Android, actually. Yeah. Well, but this will this run Android? Uh, not yet. I think there are some people that are working on porting it right now, but I, I don't think they've had um, success yet. Yeah. So I, I guess that was my thought: is without Android being there yet, is there anything today that that I could use that's in the in the Linux world that I could put on it right away, run it off a touch screen, and it might it might actually work? Do you guys know? I would say no. Uh, so, like okay. touchscreen, forget it. You know, and uh, I think there's been versions. I think I've heard of Arc Linux. So, uh, I, like again, for young kids, you know, getting into the using the Raspbian P, uh, uh, OS, which is originally they had the, the I think it was called Debian Squeeze. And uh, what happens is some guys uh, on the ARM processor takes care. Um, they have a, a thing called Hardpoint. Is it called Hardpoint, uh, Chris? Or there's I think I think it was floating point. There was floating some point. very specific thing that they needed to get this uh, working. Yeah, so that's yeah. it. There was this floating point uh, technology that's on there, and if you could have the uh, like the OS take advantage of this floating point, whatever technology, it w it was running like it would run like forty percent faster. Hmm. So now that's and that's what they call now Raspbian. 
so uh, if you use that software compared to the original one, the original was really slow. And you know, if you went to like, don't open like a, it did, did have a browser, you know, but don't open five tabs. It's kind of like right. slow. Yeah. So it's good, yeah. like you know, for you know, seven year old, ten year olds that are kind of like you know, want to just you know, there's you know, they got the whole their whole life ahead of them. You know, it doesn't matter. But they, <laughs> remember when we had the Commodore sixty four? It's like okay, load it and now go get yourself a coffee while it loads. You know, so it's a bit like uh, as far as using software, I find it's a bit like you know those earlier versions of Commodore sixty four and Vic twenties and stuff like that. But uh, the thing is, is if you go in the direction like Chris was saying that if you set it up as a PHP device or you know sort or maybe like an alarm system or something like that, then it's got a lot of good uh, good points there. And uh, like you said, uh, is uh, I think that like we said is the um, the Android. Some of these guys might port that over. We'll have to see how how quick that gets because you know us as adults, I think we we get a little quite impatient if things aren't done very quickly. <laughs> you know, we want to have five browsers open and uh, you know, so I don't think it can hack it. Yeah, so there's some there's some notion of having this be a programming educational computer for kids. You know, when I was a kid, I remember sitting down at our 286 and programming in QBasic at the command line. And and if you want to do that with your dad, right, that is something that can happen now again. So there's some nostalgia maybe for for us to be able to kind of pass that along instead of, you know, Kids these days growing up have it good, right? I, they, it's, they've got computers that are too powerful, so uh, maybe we can knock them back with this this yeah. little kind of board, right? <laughs> My 15-year-old just bought you know, or just built himself a Core i7-3770, you know, uh, just rocking fast, 2-gig uh, GPU. He, he's out there. You know, he, he basically is playing all his games in max mode at this point, and he's just he's yep. loving it because he had a piece of crap PC for the longest time, but... Um, yeah, he's not. You know, this it, he he thinks you know programming is downloading the games from Steam. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at this point, this might, this is a good a good go back to basics type device that you really can do some hacks on and get back down into the code. Um, even at the I think even at the at the the very basics, you know, the very base level of the code will allow some um, some hacking on that, and and it could be good for some for this next generation. Yeah, I mean, so you can SSH in there with the command line and use Pico to write code. You know, it's a command line text editor, and compile it. You know, maybe Python, and then you can um, you can run your code on, on that device even remotely without a monitor uh, directly attached to it. So th there's a lot of possibilities there. Oh. Yeah, uh, Chris, I just wanted to touch on like you said with coding and stuff. Uh, like a bit the way Linux stuff works is uh, you know, like let's let's say you you install some kind of app and then you want to get uh, uh, like drivers and stuff, or you need this software, there's this like GitHub, right? Or, you know, sometimes in the code you would write uh, get, uh, what is a get app? Because I'm not too familiar with yeah, the yeah. Links, but you would like go get pseudo app. Pseudo get yeah. uh, uh, PHP 5, for example. Yeah, so what happens is now your your device, because it's connected to the internet, it would go to this, uh, you know, this uh, a pool somewhere out in the cyberspace. Yeah, cyber a world there. repository. Would yeah, be a repository. Word, yeah. That's it. Right. And, it would, and it would grab the files you would need and then install it. So uh, so that's neat how, how Linux kind of does their things. And uh, so can you just explain what that Git, GitHub is? Because sometimes you can go to the site and you can see that they have these libraries and there's some information. Can you give us a little bit of what that yeah, is? Yeah, well, we'll it's, it's just a place for people to get together and write open source code. That's kind of the base of it. Um, it it's a little divorced from the apt-get uh, package manager. So it's, it's a little bit different than that because Debian manages a bunch of uh, repositories. And so when you say sudo apt-get, you're looking toward the repositories that they've set up. And so, for example, if you follow the link in the show notes to install a LAMP server, you say sudo apt-get php5, and then you say the same thing for MySQL, and you say the same thing for Apache, and then you've got a LAMP server. And you can put your uh, PHP-based website up on that. And... Um, you know, code it like that. And then GitHub is just an open source place to put code. And so you can go there, like I wrote this uh, little library for PHP for the XB, you know, and I thought, okay, well, I'll just put it out there. And, uh, you know, if somebody wants to fix it, the code's open source, and they can submit a patch and that kind of thing. And uh, that that's where most of these open source guys go to put their code um, so that people can look at it, people can fix it, and that kind of thing. Um, so... Uh, apt-get and GitHub are a little bit different, 
but they're both kind of repositories for things. Okay, so and the uh, so the ad gap is more like from within the Linux distribution or whatever yeah. command line you go and grab your stuff. Whereas the other one is like you can be on your PC, you browse, you say, oh look, this kind of library or it does yep. what I want. So now you would download that, and then maybe you know SSH into your uh, into your Raspberry Pi and then put it in a folder, and and then now at, at the Pi you would say, okay, go into that folder and 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 the files are there and execute them. Right, exactly right. Now, um, also, I mentioned Webmin earlier, which is a pretty cool utility where you install Webmin, and then instead of going to the command line in SSH, you um, you just go to the routers, or sorry, go to the Raspberry Pi's IP address, uh, and they give you a bunch of utilities where you can install packages just from a little web UI there instead of uh, going through the command line. So you can just say, hey, you know, give me PHP or give me this proxy server, like squid proxy or something like that. <clears throat> so that might make it a little bit easier uh, to use for somebody who, who's a little uncomfortable SSHing in and using command line. Cool. All right, so with that, we'll uh, wrap it up. I just want folks to know that uh, I do have a, uh, I, I was lucky enough to get uh, a donation from somebody and they, they ordered me a uh, one of those girt boards. So uh, that's on a, on a boat from uh, somewhere or in a plane or a truck or whatever. <laughs> from a slow so, boat from China? Yeah, yeah so some, actually from the UK. So oh, it's, okay. Because it's right. that guy, uh, Gert Van Lu, who is over in the UK. And he, so eventually he'll get here. And uh, I'll have to get myself, again, with the surface mount technology, I'll have to get myself a big magnifying glass and you know some tweezers and try to do some soldering. So eventually, uh, when, when I get that done and do some more experimenting, then uh, I hope we can get together and do another podcast and talk about that. Also, I hope we get a picture of you with your magnifying glass and your tweezers. That would be classic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, of the, one of the big round ones and bright yeah. light yeah. and that yeah. and, uh, stuff coming in. Good. Maybe a fisheye lens picture. Yeah. would be good. <laughs> very... So very John, hey, Chris, uh, so wh where can we find you during the week? If folks uh, pop in here, I know you do a couple other things uh, outside of, uh, of your normal job, but what do you, where, where can we find you online? Sure, you can get me on Twitter. That's the most likely uh, suspect there, at Chris Hale Barnes. It's H-A-L-E. And you can also find my podcast, The End User, um, at thedigitalmediazone.com. And so it's T-H-E-N-D-U-S-R, spelled uh, Linux-like. Very good. And John, of course, you and I podcast each week over at the Home Server Show, homeservershow.com, and John is a regular guest. Uh, it seems like not as much as l uh, lately as it's been in the past, but we got to get you back on uh, uh, the Home Tech Podcast at TheAverageGuy.tv. Gentlemen, thanks uh, for both of you for coming in today, and I think maybe the first of many podcasts uh, a pie casts. Can, is that what we call them? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> sure. That's Who good. knows what we'll come up with? Uh, everybody have a great afternoon. Thanks for, uh, for coming in today, guys. Okay. Um, so that was about an hour. Cool. cool. So and um, what? Our target. Yeah, no, it's perfect. That's good. How'd you guys, Chris? How how you feel about that? Is that what you wanted to get accomplished? Yeah, I felt pretty good about that. We yeah. went a little more ad hoc than I thought, but that's okay. I can hang with that. Are you? Do you prefer more structure in in what you're doing? I'm a very ad hoc guy, so I just I drive it that way. And I, I apologize if that was me doing that. No, that but. that that's fine. We we do the end user more structurally, but that uh, that's okay. Okay. Um, there's something to be said about just kind of like geeking out for a while, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I always I always want to work within a realm of uh, you know that's comfortable for for the users. So I, I want to make sure you're okay with with uh, with that. John and I can just sit in the app for hours and hours and hours, and yeah. it's all ad hoc. So. Um, Anyways, and then um, what, uh, what would you like me to do? One of my thoughts for an intro was uh, John passed over some music to me, and I thought about just making kind of a standard intro that had just I'll do some voiceover work and, uh, and, and just get that in and then cut right into the podcast. John had expressed to me he kind of wanted to do away with all the, hi, how you doing, what's going on, how's your life, yeah. kind of thing, and get right to the podcast. So I could um, I, I could sit down here this afternoon a little bit and and work over some text for this and then do do some voiceover work, send it out to you guys to listen to and um, work on some show notes if that's if, if that's what you guys want to do. 
Yeah, our show notes are a behemoth right now. <laughs> yeah, actually, no, what, so what I do is I just go back and listen to the show, and then I piece it together based okay. on all, all the links are there. So I'll, I'll link, I'll, you know, I'll put something together. And so um, let me, if you're listening in YouTube, Chris, there's some questions I want to ask you, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to broadcast it to the world. So uh, if you're listening in YouTube, thanks for coming out, and uh, we'll try and do this more often. You can join us over at theaverageguy.tv. Uh, and this is where we'll post that show. You can watch the video over again. Thanks for listening. <laughs>